Okay, so this set of notes, what we're basically going to be working with is we're going to go back and revisit more techniques for finding limits algebraically. Mostly because while looking at a graph and determining a limit, or looking at a table of values and determining the limit where the y values are approaching is fine, it doesn't always find an exact value for us. Uh, we want to be able to do this a little bit more mathematically, which is we want to find them algebraically. Now, we've already discussed one method of finding them algebraically, and that's the direct substitution method. The direct substitution basically just says you have, you have a continuous function at x equal to c. Then, to find the limit as x approaches c for that function, you can simply just plug in the c value and find the y value, and then that's it. And you don't have to worry about looking at the table or even looking at the graph, as long as you know that the function is continuous. Um, and that's going to require that either A, you can prove it's continuous using the three steps that we had outlined in the previous set of notes, that f of c exists, that the limit as x approaches c exists, which means both a left and a right limit exist, and the function value and the limit value are exactly the same. But there's also a shortcut that if we have certain basic parent functions that we know are continuous because we just know our algebra 2 and our trigonometry, then we can just go straight ahead and use this direct substitution. Now, so based on this, this is, you know, the give theorem names and stuff. You don't have to know this is theorem 2.1 in your textbook. But there are basically three direct consequences of this. And this is kind of like when we were back in our um, Algebra 2. You start with the most basic parent graphs and we work our way forward into the things that get more and more and more complicated. So the first kind of limit property that you are, need to know is one of those things where it's almost common sense, but we're going to write it down just to make sure we have a very thorough set of notes here. What if I wanted to find the limit as x approaches c of some constant b? Okay. So now in this set of notes here, I you know probably should make sure I make a qualification and start throwing these letters out. You really need to tell people what they are. So in this three rules that I'm going to have, we're going to have b and c are going to be real numbers, and that's what I'm going to use here, and then in just a little bit I'm going to use an n, and that n is going to be a positive integer. It's a little bit of review of some notation that you should be familiar with. Alright, so I want to find the limit of a constant, this constant b. Now let's think about the function that this is. This is nothing more than the function f of x equals b, which is a constant function. And if you recall from your knowledge of parent graphs, f of x equals b is nothing more than a horizontal line. And it's where the y value for every x value is c. And this is a direct substitution problem. It's just like, well, there's no x to substitute the value in. It doesn't really matter because for every x value, f of that value is c, or is b, I'm sorry. So basically say, hey, what's the direct substitution? I want to know as x approaches c. Well, it's going to be nothing more than b. The limit of a constant is the constant. That's kind of the English part of what we want to say there. So that's the first property that you have. The second common sense property based on this direct substitution that we have going is what's the next parent graph that you would look at. We did a horizontal line, so why don't we do a slant line? So if we take a look at the limit as x approaches c of x, and again, this is nothing more than your identity function parent graph. So if we take a look at it, we know that it's going to simply be a diagonal line going through the origin, continuous clearly. So in this case, f of x equals x. I can do direct substitution, plug in the value, and you would end up with our plug in c. You end up with c. So the limit of x as x approaches c is c. And then the third one, Okay, again, kind of working our way up is this idea that what if I had a exponent or a power on the x value? It was kind of like we went constant function, linear function, and then the very next thing you did in your parent graphs is like x squared and x cubed and, and those kinds of things. x to the fifth, you know, the nice even and odd power function. So in that case, we're going to be looking at the limit as x approaches c of x to some power n. And clearly, if we're looking at even and odd power functions, then you have your nice parabola. And I'm just doing little quick sketches down here for you. So this would be x to the n, where n is even. Okay. 
And then you have your odd power functions. I didn't change color, but that's okay. Which look like this. And that would be x to the n where n is odd. Clearly, both continuous functions. So again, our little property of if the function is continuous, then we can simply plug it in. We can plug it in. So it becomes c to the n. So those are the, like the three building blocks of the limit properties that we're going to be looking at. All right, and then the next thing that we're going to look at is some a, a little bit more uh, complex limits, but really not that much. I mean, it's kind of this idea is, all right, now that you've got these building blocks together, then what we started to do in Algebra 2 is we started creating new functions from basic functions by multiplying them by something, adding or subtracting two different functions together, multiplying or dividing two functions, and then composition. So we're just going to talk about how limits are affected when we start doing the combinations of functions together, and that's what's going to be in the next little section. All right, so in this set of notes, uh, again, it's just basically all about the combinations that you're looking at. And again, the nice thing is, is, is pretty much in the most part, most of these properties are fairly straightforward and common sense. Um, I do want you to make sure that you get these down and you have these in your notes so that you can go back and study them, but they're pretty straightforward and it's not really anything that you're going to spend too much time uh, trying to memorize because they're common sense. So like for example, this first one. If I have the sum or difference, I can do one and two together here. If I have the sum or difference of two functions, it doesn't matter what they are, how complex they are. Now, when I do this, if I know the limit of the first function as x approaches c, it exists, and I know the limit of the second function as x approaches c, then the limit of the sum is nothing more than the sum of the limits. So as long as both of these limits exist, then you can go ahead and you can calculate this sum or difference, makes it, it's fine. But again, I will put a caveat that you have to make sure that both of these limits exist in order for you to break them apart. But you can do this and then try to calculate these limits. This one right here, right? so this was my, I'll just put a little note here, my sum and difference. That's how I was combining my two different functions together. Then we scroll down and take a look at the next section. This is what we call a scalar multiple. I'm going to multiply the function by some constant. And I'm, right here I'm just going to say k is some real number. It can be any real number you want. And really that scalar multiple, which is nothing more than stretching or shrinking the graph, does not really affect anything other than it takes every y value on the graph and then either stretches or shrinks it, scales it vertically. So multiplying by scalar multiple will take the limit, which is the y value the function approaches as x approaches z, and it will scale that y value just like it scaled every y value on the graph. So the limit of a scalar times a function is nothing more than the scalar times the limit of the function. Again, pretty straightforward, basically says, hey, if there's a number in front, you can just pull it out. All right, and then we have our product here. And we, then we add, subtract the functions, multiply by a constant. We can multiply two functions times each other. And again, the nice thing is, it's just like common sense, hey, the limit of a product is the product of the limits. Okay, so this is our kind of our product rule for limits and straightforward. Now the next one that I have that I'm looking at here is the idea that what if you do division? And I don't know why there's a little extra little line there. Just ignore that for the moment. Now just like you get up here, the limit of a product is the product of the limits. You can look at your limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits. However, I want you to notice that we added an extra little caveat here, which is not only do the limits have to exist, which is what is true up here, the limits have to exist and the denominator's limit cannot be zero because otherwise you would cause a division by zero problem, which would mean that the limit does not exist. All right, and so that's really the only caveat. It's like, hey, when you divide, you just can't divide by zero. So you want to make sure that you are paying attention to that. Now, coming down here, this is the first kind of, this is a composition, but it's kind of a simple composition, and, and we see this a lot, so we're going to go ahead and pull it out. When you have a function raised to a power, and again, kind of in looking at this, we're basically saying n is uh, still a positive integer here, because we're, we're trying to really get into the 
simplest case that you have. So n is a positive integer, squared, cubed, fourth power, fifth power, and so on. But if n is such a nice number that if I want to find the limit of a function to a power, I can simply find the limit of the function and then just raise it to that power. Um, we'll talk about why when I come down here to number 7, because um, 6 is actually a special case of 7, uh, but we want to kind of separate it out because we see this one so much that it should be wrote that, hey, just pull the power out and take the limit of the inside and then just raise it to the power. All right, so there's our nice little power rule for our exponent. Now, number 7 is kind of the overreaching um, property that number 6 is related to, which really has to do with composition. Now, you want to be very kind of careful about this one. Now, notice that what I'm saying here first is you have this composition. This is what I'm actually trying to calculate. The limit as x approaches c of a composition is f of g of x. Notice that right in here you have your inside function, and then you have your outside function f that the first thing, notice what they're giving you is that you look at the inside function and you basically first calculate the limit of the inside function. So that's kind of your step one when you are looking at a composition. I want to calculate this limit. I go, okay, I want to take the limit as x approaches c of the inside function and figure out what it is. And in this case, we've decided we figured out that it's going to be L. Now, once I know that it's L, now, if f was continuous and defined at L, then I could simply just plug it in. But what you have to remember is we're talking about discontinuous functions here. These properties are going to apply for continuous and discontinuous functions. Notice in all of these properties up here, I never said that g of c was going to exist or not exist. I simply said the limit as x approaches c of g of x existed. So when you're looking at this, this idea is maybe this f of g of x is not a continuous function at x equal to c. So what I can do is I can first calculate the limit as x approaches c for g of x, figure out what it is. But you don't just plug it into f because we don't know whether or not you're going to have any continuity things there. So don't get into the whole direct substitution for these. What you have to do in the second stage is you're going to let x approach l. Because if x approaches c, what that implies is that g of x approaches L, okay? And remember, g of x is your inside function, and when the inside function, once I take it out, remember, the x replaces it. So now you're going x goes to L, which is really saying g of x went to L. And that's what this is telling us, is that you have to do this composition in two stages. Calculate the limit of the inside function, and then use that to calculate the limit of the outside function. And then if that limit exists, then the limit of the composition will exist. And so this one's a little bit weird. You get kind of caught up in that whole direct substitution, and you think that everything's hunky-dory, but then you figure out that it's not. Like, for example, suppose I have the limit. I'll just do a little quick side example here. Suppose I have the limit as x approaches c of the function g of x. Let's suppose that it's 0. So I already figured it out. I don't really care what the function is. It's not defined at g of c is not 0 necessarily. It could be, but not necessarily. I know that the limit is 0. And I want to find, using this information, the limit as x approaches c of the square root of g of x. So kind of looking at this, my composition, my inside function is g of x. My outside function is the square root of x. So, uh, in this, this is the limit as x approaches c, I would say, well, what's the limit as x approaches c of g of x? And you go, hey, that limit is 0. Do not think that you're just going to plug this in and go, hey, square root of 0 is 0. That's not going to give us the correct answer to this. What you want to do is say, I want to now do the limit as x approaches 0, changes to this limit, of the square root of, and remember, the x is now representing the inside function that's where the inside function went to. So this is kind of now what we are looking at. And then we want to calculate this limit, and that's why I wanted to show you this example. What's the limit as x approaches 0 of square root of x? And if you'll recall from the previous set of notes, this does not exist because this has a regional discontinuity. There's no left side 
it's not continuous at zero, so you can't have a limit because there's no left-hand limit to equal the right-hand limit, which is a requirement for the limit to exist. So it actually does not exist. The most common mistake for this problem is to say, hey, direct substitution, and you go ahead and you plug it in, you go square root of zero, square root of zero, zero, but that's not true. So you want to kind of be careful, don't fall into that trap. All right. And so now here's just a, a quick example kind of, of how the limits would work when you're doing this kind of more complicated composition and combinations and things put together. Notice that what you're trying to do here is you have a limit as x approaches c, you have a square root of 3 plus f of x, so that's our inside here, and then you have your x times g of x squared. So we have two compositions going along. Now notice what you're basically going to do here is the first thing you're going to do is calculate the limit of the inside functions. So you get to here and you say, okay, I can go ahead, the 3 plus, because that's a sum, so I can ignore the 3, this is the inside. So I would come over here and do this and calculate this limit first. Then I would add it to the 3. Over here, you would plug this in, calculate this limit. Notice that here is the limit of a product. So limit of a product and then so you would basically work this out using each of these little rules that you have going through and again you know you do want to be careful and pay attention to the continuity and the issue that I brought up with seven all right so let's look at some examples I'm going to give you a chance to kind of work through them first and then we'll come back together and we'll discuss so I'm going to pause it give you a second go ahead and see if you can using the given information the limit as x approaches c of f of x is 8. The limit for g of x is negative 2. And the limit for h of x is 0. I want you to find the limits if they exist. And if they don't exist, tell me why or why not. So take a moment, look at these three problems, give them a try. All right, so let's take a look at part A together. And again, I'm just going to kind of show you. I don't want just an answer here. Uh, part of AP Calculus is, if required, you have to kind of show the steps that you have used to get it in order to get full credit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one property per step to kind of show you and illustrate which properties we're using as we go. So the first thing is I look here and here and I say I have the difference of two functions. So I'm going to break this up. The limit of a difference is the difference of the limit. So it becomes the limit as x approaches c of 2f of x minus the limit as x approaches c of 3g of x. So I apply that first property about the difference of functions. Now I look at our two separately, basically, and I say, hey, this has a scalar multiple in front of the function in both cases. And the limit, when you have a scalar multiple, you can pull it to the front. So I scale the limit. So this is equal to 2 times the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus 3 times the limit as x approaches c of g of x. And then from there, we now know what these limits are, and we can just do substitution. The limit as x approaches c of f of x was 8. And the limit as x approaches c of g of x was negative 2. So put the negative 2 in, and then simply just do your arithmetic, 16 plus 6, and get my 22, which is my final answer. So when you're doing these, you kind of want to show each of these properties being used so that you can follow along and set them up. Okay, so I'm going to give another pause and let you go back and think about these and write each step down using the properties and then we'll go over them. Alright, let's take a look at the part B here. And again, showing each step as we go. First thing we notice is we have the limit of a function squared. And that's that special case of composition, kind of why we kind of separate that one out. That if we have the limit of a function squared, you can find the limit of the function and then square it on the outside. So that's the same as the limit as x approaches c of 2 g of x. And then notice I'm going to put the square on the outside. You can pull the power out. So that's the first step. Then I have the limit of a scalar again. So I can pull the scalar out to the front. Just ignoring the 2, the square on the outside, we have 2 limit as x approaches c of g of x squared. And then we come down here and we say, well, we already know what this is, so now we can just go ahead and substitute 2 times negative 2 squared, which happens to give us negative 4 squared or 
16. So again, one property per step showing each of the properties that we are using. Okay. All right, now let's go over here to part C. I can give you a second again now that you've seen this. See if you want to adjust anything in your work over there. So take a moment and work that one. All right, so let's take a look at this one and see what you came up with. And hopefully you came up with that this actually does not exist. So we have to explain why and let's kind of show the steps. The first part is pretty straightforward. The limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. So we break it up. Limit as x approaches c. Cube root of f of x over g of x plus the limit as x approaches c of 4 over h of x. And then we come to the next step, which is the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, provided the limit on the bottom is not zero. So in this first one, we would break this apart as a limit as x approaches c, cube root of f of x, divided by the limit as x approaches c of g of x. And then I check, what's the limit as x approaches c of g of x? Well, it's negative 2, which is not 0, so we're all good to, all good there. I move on to the second one. I do the same thing. The limit as x approaches c of 4 divided by the limit as x approaches c of h of x. And then I check, does that limit equal 0? And the answer is yes. So right here is where you have the problem. That limit cannot be 0 because that gives you a division by 0 problem. And as soon as the limit crashes, kind of here in the middle, we know that this limit does not exist. Right? Everybody good with that example? Now, before I move on from this example, I do want to kind of talk about this part over here. Even though it doesn't matter, once I got the failure over here, the whole limit doesn't exist because of the division by zero problem. Uh, what I want to have a conversation is, is what would you have done here okay if I had to just calculate just the first part so if I just wanted to we'll call this example B if what I wanted to do is the limit as X approaches C cube root of F of X over G of X if I just wanted to do that part again we can do the first stage which is split it up X approaches C of the cube root of F of X over the limit as x approaches c of g of x. Now this is where that whole composition comes in. What you have to remember is that when you're actually doing this, you have to first go, I have to calculate the composition, because this is not the nice power that's out there. We have the limit as x approaches c of the cube root of f of x. You first have to calculate the limit of the inside. And recall that the limit as x approaches c of f of x was 8. And so what this is going to change into is this becomes the limit as x approaches the new value here, 8, of the outside function, which is cube root of x. And then, of course, the limit as x approaches c of g of x was negative 2. I'll go ahead and put that in. Now, this limit I didn't have to, I don't have it up here as one of these limits, but I know this function, it's cube root function. Cube root functions, remind you, your parent graphs are continuous. So it comes in with something like this coming out. So it's a continuous function, so now I can use direct substitution. Uh, it doesn't always work out. You're like, well, why didn't I just go ahead and substitute the 8 right in? Well, because you do have to make sure that this outside function is a continuous function, you can use direct substitution. So you have to make sure you address this. It's a fine, kind of fine nuance to this, but this is where you'll get tripped up on the AP with something where they have like a special case here where the limit may not exist. So by direct substitution now, I know I'm going to have the cube root of 8 over negative 2, which is 2 over negative 2 or negative 1. So kind of just an additional little example for that piece. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the next set of examples. And this is something that you're going to see quite a bit on the AP is, in addition to just using the properties, which is what we did in the previous one, where they gave you the limits of f of x and g of x, 
a lot of times they like to combine it together and say here are the properties and you have to actually be able to look at a graph and get the limits that are there now kind of on this it, it is true that kind of on this example and let me make sure I'm on this page there's probably a hole there because you have a point there and these I don't really care whether which one's the hole which one's filled in because it's not really going to matter for the limits because I don't care what the actual function value is I only care about what the limit is so it's not really going to matter whether this is one of these has to be open or they're both open so just letting you know that it doesn't really matter in this case if you want to fill in a dot here an open circle there feel free but you don't need it for this um, activity so what we're going to do is we're basically going to come down and see if I can keep them in the picture here while I do the first example for you. So you basically you come here and you go, I'm going to apply the properties. So you apply the properties and you say, and at a certain point you will get to the uh, section that what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that you think about the properties, but in a lot of cases you can simplify it down, you don't have to do one per step, because in a lot of times, they, especially in the multiple choice section, you don't necessarily have to show work, you just have to be able to calculate it. So like here, what I would do here is I would look at it and i say, well I have the limit of a sum, so I can put the limit in front of both, I have a scalar multiple in front, so I can always pull that out, and then I have a power and I can pull that out too. So kind of in my mind, I'm going to go, I'm going to do all in one step, 2 times the limit, as x approaches 0 of f of x squared. So I'm going to use the properties, but I am going to make sure that I write it down all in one step. I don't necessarily have to get to the point where you have to write every single step down. The idea is just like to show that you're using the properties. And don't fall into the pitfalls when you have the compositions that you have to worry about. So then here, because you have the scalar, so 3 times the limit as x approaches 0 of g of x. So you should have a step somewhere. You can have your intermediate steps, but you should have a step somewhere that gets you to here. And then you come down and say, now what I have to do is I have to go to the graph, and I have to use the graph to answer the question of what's the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x. So I find f, x is approaching 0, I look at the graph, and I say, where are we going? We're going to 2. So this would end up being 2 times 2 squared. And then I go over and I look at the g of x graph as x approaches 0. And as x approaches 0, I look at the graph, it's also going to 0. So it would be 3 times 0, which is going to give me my final answer of 4 times 2, or 8. So that's kind of the process that you're going to be going through when you work through these. Now I'm going to do the same thing, I'll do the second example over here. And again, you get to the point where you can start doing things more than one object in a step. I have the limit of a product and a quotient, which is really going to be the limit, the product of the limits divided by the limit down here, and the power I can go ahead and pull out. So we can kind of do this all in one step. So it becomes the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x, and then you'll square the whole thing, times the limit as x approaches negative 3 of g of x divided by the limit as x approaches negative 3 of f of x. Now I will kind of immediately go to this denominator because remember the quotient only works as long as your denominator's limit is not 0. So let's check that real quick. We're going as x approaches negative 3, so we're up here. Here's my negative 3 and I look down at the graph, what's the graph doing? It appears to be approaching negative 1. So we're good on the denominator. This one right here, this is not one of those functions. Don't get confused up here. This is the limit of the identity function. And direct substitution, constant, or continuous function. So I can just plug it in, it becomes negative 3 squared. And then we have our limit as x approaches negative 3 of g of x. So I find here's my 1, 2, 3. Here's where my negative 3 is. I say, what's the function doing? Oh, it's a constant, and it's at 1. So we end up with our negative 3 squared, which is 9. 9 divided by negative 1, negative 9. So that's going to be our values for that. All right, let's take a look at C. Okay, now remember, with C, you have those two steps. The first thing that you're going to have to do, so I'll kind of do this up here, is figure out what's the limit as x approaches negative 3 of the inside function 
f of x. So this is what I'm going to calculate first. And we just did that, and it is negative 1. So that's negative 1. So our next step is not, we're not plugging in and we're not calculating g of negative 1. We are doing the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x. Notice the fine difference there. I don't basically plug in, I don't calculate f of negative 3 and do a direct substitution. I first calculate the limit of the inside. Then I reset up my limit by getting rid of the inside function and having the x approach the limit value that I just found. Now I come up here to the g of x and we're doing negative 1. So we're looking here. See, the common mistake is y'all get into this whole plug and chug thing and you simply plug in the negative 1 that you found here and go, oh, g of negative 1 is 2, and you give me the answer of 2. That's not correct. You're looking for the limit as x approaches negative 1. The limit is going to 1. So your actual answer for this problem is 1. Right? I'm going to take a pause and let you work uh, the problems that are down here at the bottom, and then we'll come back together and you can check your answers. Okay, so now let's take a look at these three um, examples, and let's go ahead and see if you check your work and see if you got them correct. Over here, just a quick recap, I took the limit. First thing I did, because it's a composition, is I did the limit of the inside function, and I calculated that to be 1. So, and I didn't have to look at the graphs because it's x squared, and that's a direct substitution. Just plug it in, and it ended up being negative 1 squared, which is 1. Okay? Then I do the limit as x approaches 1 on g of x. Notice I don't plug in 1 into g of x. I'm looking at the limit as x approaches 1. And then we came up to the graph. The limit as x approaches 1, which is here and here. I look at the graph, and it is negative 1. And so that's how we came up with our negative 1. Now notice here for e that you're not actually doing the limit as x approaches 1. You're doing a left-hand limit. And that does make a difference. You, it follows the same properties, but you just have to make sure that once you split everything up, you're doing left-hand limits only. So in this one, I did the quotient and pulled the scalar out. So I just went ahead and went straight to this and pulled the power out too. And then the first thing I did is I checked this limit at the bottom. Just need to make sure that this bottom does not end up being zero, causing division by zero. So I did the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of g of x. And from the left, it didn't really matter, left and right are the same here, but it was negative 1. So that's how I got this negative 1 right here. The limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x. So when I look at f of x, and again I'm approaching 1, but I'm approaching from the left. I don't care about this side, I care about that side. So you're on this part of the graph, which means you're going to 2. And so that's where this 2 comes into play. And then just simply calculate it and you get 4. Now, taking a look at this one, see, does not exist. So take a moment, read through that, see why it does not exist. All right, so let's talk about why this limit does not exist. Remember that the first thing you have to do, because this is a composition, is you have to do the limit of the inside function. And I actually didn't even have to worry about the 5 and the minus and all that stuff, because when I did the limit of the inside function, I found that that's where the limit kind of fails to exist. You have the limit of a product, and so I went ahead and split it up, and again, I did all the steps kind of in one. I did the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the x squared, because the power, you can move to the outside. And then the sum, I did the limit of this one, and went ahead and distributed the limit over the sum, okay, here and here. And then when I went to go do this limit as x approaches negative 1 for f of x, over here on f of x, you have... And where am I approaching? I'm approaching negative 1. Here's my negative 1. As I approach negative 1, because I didn't say from the left or the right, notice I go to two different values. The left side is approaching 1. The right side is approaching 2. So therefore, that limit does not exist. And as soon as you get that limit not existing, you're done with the problem, and this does not exist. Now, what I would like you to do, this will be the end of part 1, but what I'd like you to do before you come to class is do this problem, and we'll discuss it kind of as our class opener for next class. Do 5 minus the limit as x approaches negative 1, 
And the only thing I'm going to change is I'm going to do x squared and then 3 plus, I'm going to make this a g of x. And I want you to do this problem. And again, remember, start same way I did here. Start with the limit of the inside function. Once you get that value, this will turn into the limit as x approaches the limit of the inside function of square root of x, because they're going to take your inside function out. So I will leave that for you to do as kind of a little practice problem leading into next class. And that ends part one uh, for the limit properties.